Hey, thank you. Uh, make sure this is working. There it is. Good. All right, that's going to be hard for Greg. So, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2005-2006 Science Technology Society Program, which is also the Linus Pauling Memorial Lecture Series. My name is Terry Bristol. I'm the president of the Institute for Science, Engineering, and Public Policy. And it's the institute that organizes the series. So, of course, the series would not actually happen if it wasn't for our partners and our co-sponsors. So, uh, one of my functions here tonight is to give them a little recognition, which I will do. It was also on the inside of your program, but there you go. So Mentor Graphics Foundation, or sorry, Mentor Graphics Corporation has been our lead corporate co-sponsor for a number of years now, and uh, thank you to them. Also, uh, Oregon Episcopal School, Morgan Stanley. All right, oh yes, this here, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Morgan Stanley, FEI Company, Oregon Public Broadcasting, the Oregon University System, it's the Chancellor's Office, as well as the campuses, uh, Oregon State, Portland State, Western Oregon. Linus Pauling Institute, uh, Warner Pacific, Portland Community College, Clark College, uh, Mount Hood Community College, Lynn Benton Community College, and Callan Gable's been in there, and IDC Architects, and thank you to all of them. It makes this possible. It's, a, it's really a coalition, it's a partnership of business and foundations and so forth. Speaking of foundations, besides Mentor Graphics Corporation, uh, co-sponsoring this Mentor Graphics Foundation. We went to them a few years ago and said, you know, we think that we can make a really good partnership with the schools, but it's hard to go into the schools and compete for funds that aren't there. So they gave us a grant, and we've been working on that grant for a number of years, and it's been hugely successful, and it's developing even further. Uh, we just did a, an event up at Portland State, a kind of a pre-function. So any of you that are in the K-12 program, uh, uh, if you didn't hear about this already, we just, it was pretty quick this time, but in the next lectures we're going to do these sort of pre-functions for the high school and some middle school uh, students, teachers, and parents at Portland State ahead of time, and then uh, uh, they're coming down here. Are you guys here? Did you guys make it from Portland State? Yeah, you sir? Okay. Thanks. <laughs> So all the, all the K-12 people, can you, because the guy I'm about to introduce is, is a key decision maker in uh, supporting this program. So, uh, so Greg Hinckley, so can you, all the people here in the K-12 program, can we hear like a little applause here? Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right, we're cooking. Okay. Now, there are question cards. There'll be Q&A afterwards. There are microphones uh, in the aisles, as usual, one up, two down. And there's also the cards. So fill out the cards. And if you want to get a little email notices, send me some, put your email address in there, too, is cool. And um, they will, when, the talk, when he sort of finishes the talk, then the ushers will come up and down the aisles and hand those cards out to the sides. They'll grab them, pick them up, you know, and I'll sort some, but he'll also take questions from the audience. We'll do both of those. Okay, so uh, it's now my great pleasure, great, great pleasure, because this guy's a wonderful guy who is a major uh, partner in so many things that go on in this community, including our, uh, our program here, uh, that I want to give him a great hand. Uh, Greg Hinckley, who's the president of Mentor Graphics Corporation. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. It looks like this evening I'll be mic challenged as always. I'm six foot seven, and so typically the mics that work for uh, people who are more normal size are, are a little more difficult for me. Uh, Mentor is involved in the advance of, of uh, hardware and software in electronics, and it's in our interest to interest you in both science and technology. We've been a, a uh, sponsor of this institute for the last six years and are proud to do so. Tonight, it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Gibor Basri. Uh, Dr. Basri was born in New York City, raised in Colorado. He ha comes from a tradition of certainly both the left brain and the right brain because his father was a professor of physics at Colorado State University while his mother was a dance instructor. That's a nice mix. So Dr. Basri attended Stanford University where he received a Bachelor of Science in Physics. He subsequently received a PhD in Astrophysics from the University of Colorado in Boulder. 
Since 1994, he has been a professor of astronomy at the University of California, Berkeley, where his work has fo focused on star formation and most specifically the study of brown dwarfs. He's received numerous awards, including the Sigma 11 Distinguished Lectureship and a NASA Faculty Fellowship. He now serves as a co-investigator on the upcoming NASA Kepler space mission, and that mission is intended to discover extrasolar terrestrial planets and characterize these planets in uh, inner solar systems. Dr. Basri will specifically be responsible for understanding the noise that stellar variability introduces into the detection of planetary transits. Tonight's talk will deal with the purpose and the progress of the Kepler missions. Please welcome Dr. Gibor Basri. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I guess I brought something good and something bad from the Bay Area. I brought you some nice sunny weather. But I, <laughs> but I gather I also brought you bad traffic, so uh, apologize for that. We're going to get away from worldly concerns uh, tonight very quickly, however. Uh, so I, what I want to do tonight is talk to you about the, uh, the search for other worlds. This is a search that people have always wondered about. People have wondered whether the Earth is the only place where there's life or the only place where there are people. Uh, and we, we live at a privileged time today. This is the time when humanity will find out whether we are alone or not. It's, it's already happening. It's happening now. When I started lecturing on this uh, 20 years ago at Berkeley, I talked about everything hypothetically. Now in my lecture, I give facts about uh, many parts of this search. So I want to talk to you about what we've been learning in the various searches for planets, and then I'll take most of my talk to talk about a very exciting mission that NASA has funded that will be going up soon that should do the, the real work of finding uh, extrasolar Earths. I promised to say a little bit about why we think it's useful to search for planets. I mean, before about 1960, we really had absolutely no idea whether planets are common or whether our solar system is fairly unique in the, in the galaxy. And now we have a much better idea. This is because of advances in technology and new telescopes, new kinds of detectors, new kinds of instruments, uh, spacecraft instruments, and so on. And they've allowed us to actually watch as other stars and planets form uh, nearby in our galaxy. So I want to first talk a little bit about star formation itself. Everybody is familiar with this picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which is a picture of a star forming region. Uh, you've seen the, the pillars of creation, as they're called. I wanted to give you the context of this. So, so these three pillars here uh, are right there. <laughs> that little hand. And this is a new picture from the Spitzer Space Telescope, which takes pictures in the infrared. So what this is showing you is the glowing dust clouds, of which uh, these are just a tiny part. And if you look carefully at these, you see tiny little knots on them. And each of those little knots is a newly forming star. So the scale of this uh, is many light years across. And we have these regions all through the galaxy. We can study them at infrared and radio and, and optical and x-ray wavelengths now and watch stars actually forming. What we know is that uh, the galaxy makes, makes something like one star every year. So it's a very active, ongoing process. And we see it going on. It, it happens. It only takes a few hundred thousand years to, to build up an individual star. These, these clouds collapse essentially under their own weight and, and make a star. Uh, but then after about 10 million years or so, all the stars are turned on, especially the, the bright blue ones, as you can see here. And they're really too powerful for their stellar nursery. They actually tear the place apart. As you can see here, it's clearing out the, uh, the material that could make new stars. So you get a, a cluster of stars, and the, the star formation process stops in that place. But then it starts up somewhere else. 
in the galaxy. We have very detailed views of this now. Uh, we can actually see, see down to the scale of other planetary systems. So here's the famous Orion Nebula uh, as seen from the ground. Uh, if you look at it with the Hubble Space Telescope, you can zoom in on the bright central core here and see these four bright stars and also lots of other little dots. Every other little dot you see there is a newly forming star. And you can zoom in even further. Here are those four stars again. Uh, and now you see these little windsock-like things. Each of those is a newly forming star. And the, question, the next question is, and how many of them tend to form planetary systems? And we know our planetary system is, is made like a disk. All the planets are in a plane. They all go around the same way, kind of like a CD. Uh, and so if you're going to make a planetary system, you could be looking for disks. And what we see is inside each of these windsocks, uh, you can see the disks, the actual protoplanetary disks that would be forming so, uh, planets today. Uh, so here, for example, is a little disk. Here's, here's one seen edge on, with a starlight in the middle. Uh, the scale of this, this little bar here, is twice as far as it is across our whole solar system. So you're seeing these, these things from very far away, but they're, they're big disks, and they have plenty of mass to make lots of planets. And so this process leads to protoplanetary disks. And what we now understand about star formation is that it's almost guaranteed that you will get a protoplanetary disk around a star. The, the, the mere process of gathering the star and the fact that the clouds that collapse to make stars always are spinning leads inexorably to a disk of gas and dust around the star. So we see lots of disks. That's an empirical fact now. The next question is, how many of them go through this next process where you gather up the dust in the disk into larger bodies, and the larger bodies gather themselves up into even larger bodies, and you actually get planets? So that's the, that's the next question. So we've answered the question, you know, is, is our planetary disks common? Yes, they are, but are planets common? It's only in the last 10 years that we've gotten any information about this. Uh, so the search for extrasolar planets takes place a number of different ways, and I'll talk briefly about them. Uh, probably many of you are familiar with the, with the usual one. Uh, so there are some indirect ways of looking for planets around stars. And then there are some semi-direct ways, uh, like the one the Kepler mission uses. And then, of course, the direct method would be to actually take a picture of the planet. That, that, that would be very nice. That's also very hard. So I'll talk a bit about that, too. This is the method that has discovered more than 150 uh, planets around other stars to date. Uh, it's called the, uh, well, astronomers call it the precision radial velocity method. Uh, most of the public, I think, calls it the wobble method. Uh, but whatever, it's, it uses the fact that when a planet goes around a star, the star, in a sense, goes around the planet, too, or it doesn't really go around the planet, but it goes around the center of mass between the star and the planet. Now, a star has got a lot more mass than a planet. So the planet swings in a big, huge orbit, and the star swings in a tiny little orbit around the center of mass between them. But we can, we can see the star. Stars are easy to see. Planets are not so easy to see. So we use the, the motion of the star caused by the planet pulling on it to infer that there's a planet there. So this would be uh, a star going, and this fixed point would then be the center of mass between it and the planet. So the planet's always on the other side of this cross uh, from the star and, and much further away. Well, you see that it's going back and forth. And it, even as, as police cars sound high when they come towards you and low when they go away from you, light does the same thing. So the light from the star uh, has a higher frequency when the star is coming towards the Earth, and it has a lower frequency when it's going away from the Earth. Not by much. Uh, but we have, you have little markers in the, the light from the star, and those markers will move back and forth in frequency as the star goes around the center of mass. And that's the, the method that has found most of the planets to date. It's not an easy measurement. The velocity of the star caused by 
a typical planet, like, for example, the velocity of the sun caused by Jupiter, because, of course, it happens here, too, uh, is shown in this plot. And the only thing to notice here is the scale on this. This is zero velocity, the, the average velocity. This is 10 meters per second. Now, a meter is this far, so you, it moves 10 of those in one second. I can't run quite that fast, but I could drive that fast. So the star is moving kind of at the speed of a car uh, around the center of mass. And the amount by which the frequency changes is the ratio of that speed, the speed of a car, to the speed of light. <laughs> Light's a little bit faster than my car. <laughs> you, can, you can get around the Earth seven times in one second if you ride light, and you can get across the block if you ride my car. So you have to make the measurement to a part in 100 million. You have to have a precision in the frequency of a part in 100 million to actually see the markers in the, in the star's light move back and forth. That's not easy, but it's obviously doable because we're doing it now. Uh, and one of my colleagues at Berkeley is the main practitioner of this. He's found more of the, the planets than anyone else uh, using this method. The first time this worked was only 10 years ago. So just about exactly 10 years ago. Uh, and again, you, you see motions of a star. So this is the velocity of the star plotted here, again, in meters per second. And if it just does a regular thing and it, and it does it with a strict period, that means the pl a planet is pulling the star around. It's, it's planets, of course, you know, the Earth takes one year to go around. It always takes one year to go around. So each planet has a very nice period in which it makes the star go towards us and away from us. If the planet is not going in a circle, then the star behaves a little strangely. When the planet gets close to it, it goes fast. When the planet's further away, it goes slower. And so you get funny-shaped curves like that. And it's extremely hard to generate a curve like that by anything other than a planet in a funny-shaped orbit. So it was pretty clear that people were seeing uh, planets around other stars when we started seeing all these periodic orbits with the right shapes to be orbits. So this is done primarily from the Keck telescopes on the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And there's an ongoing search now of 2,000 stars uh, to look for planets. The big surprise when this was first um, announced was the, the kind of planets one sees. The Doppler search works best if you have a massive planet so it can pull the star harder. And also if the planet is close to the star. If the planet's close to the star, it doesn't take very long to get around. So this motion occurs relatively quickly. But nobody expected uh, a four-day orbit for a massive planet. Four-day orbit, uh, here's our solar system with Mercury and Venus. This first planet showed up really close to the star with the mass of Jupiter. That was a complete surprise. In fact, people basically didn't believe it for a while. So they made all kinds of tests, but they also began finding other, other instances of this. So now, now we certainly do believe it. Um, so that means that we were immediately surprised by the planetary systems that we found. They didn't look like ours at all. You know, Jupiter is five times as far away from the sun as the Earth is. The Earth on this picture would be out here, so Jupiter would be way out there. And this one's way in there. And we actually don't have any idea how you would form a Jupiter-sized planet that close to the star. So we actually don't think you form it there. It got there some other way. This, is, this shows why we want to do this test, okay? You, could, you can say, well, look, you've found all these protoplanetary disks. You seem to understand, you know, that there must be lots of planets out there. Nature always surprises you. You need to actually observe what's out there before you're sure. So we're sure there are a lot of disks out there. We're not so sure about planets because clearly we don't ever know everything there is to know about planets because this was a complete surprise. So I want to just briefly review the properties of the planets that have been found so far. Um, there are just a few things you could say about them. Uh, one is, this is a distribution of how many planets you find at different masses. So this is the mass in Jupiter masses. So twice Jupiter, four times Jupiter, etc. You can see there's a big pileup of planets 
at low masses, that is one Jupiter mass or less. And the, the radio velocity method is least sensitive to lower mass planets. So it's much better at picking out these planets than those planets. So that tells you right away that nature likes to make planets that are like Jupiter or less massive. It doesn't, doesn't really like to make uh, many Jupiter mass planets because uh, the, the search is sensitive the other way to this. You can look at the distribution of how those planets are laid out in the systems. So this is just the distance from the star. Um, and I've marked the location of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter on this plot. So there are a lot of, a lot of Jupiter mass planets that are inside Mercury. As I said, that was, a, that was a big surprise. The other big surprise about many of these planets is they didn't have circular orbits either. Many of the orbits are egg-shaped. Now, if you think about forming planets in the, in the disk, uh, you shouldn't get egg-shaped orbits from that. The, the, disk, the disk material goes around in circles around the star. If you make planets in there, you'd kind of expect them to do that too. So this suggests that something has happened to these planets, and it suggests it twice, one by the shape of their orbit and one by the fact that they're, they're all, a lot of them are, are pretty far in where we don't expect to see them. They were pushed there somehow. Either the disk formed them where you thought it should form them and then dragged them, dragged them in, and then something made them go not in circles, or you make planets out there and you make too many of them. If you make several Jupiters and they're too close to each other, then they begin to bother each other a great deal. Uh, they exchange energy and angular momentum. One Jupiter may be ejected out of the system altogether, and the other Jupiter may drop in towards the star, ending up in a much smaller egg-shaped orbit. We don't know for sure, but we do know that these systems show that they're not the way they started. There, there was some, some violent events which shift the planets around. We actually think our own solar system is like that too. We think our Jupiter is not where it was formed. We think Neptune moved out a fair amount. Things got shuffled around. We think there were several more terrestrial planets in the inner solar system, one of which crashed into the Earth and made our moon. So the, the picture of, of planet formation has gotten a little violent, uh, and we, we now understand that, that uh, when you see a, a mature system, you're not seeing it the way it started. The final thing to say is that uh, here's the percent of stars that have radial velocity planets. So that's not the only way to search for planets, and it's only sensitive to inner planets, but these percentages are already kind of high. They rise this way, uh, this is stars which have more heavy metals in them. And by heavy metals, we just mean things like magnesium, silicon, carbon, iron, things like that. Things that are on the Earth. If you see more stuff like that in the star, you find a higher likelihood that there are planets around it. But in any case, the percentage of planets is, you know, up, up at the 5-10% level. That's 5 or 10% of all the stars that were looked at with this one method, which is only sensitive to certain kinds of planets. So there's a huge piece of evidence that planets are very common. Okay? You know, there are uh, more than 100 billion stars in the galaxy. If 10% of them have planets, that's a whole lot of planetary systems. Well, there are other methods look, to look for planets, uh, most of which haven't really paid off yet. So, this is the same trick as the radio velocity method, except you don't use uh, the Doppler shift. You just actually watch the star. So you can't, let's say you can't see the planet, but you can see the star. You can measure its position very carefully. Well, then you'll actually see the star executing little circles or, or complicated shapes. This is what our sun does under the influence of both Jupiter and Saturn, primarily. It kind of executes this weird pattern. If you saw that, you could tell that there are several planets uh, around that star, that pull it around like that. This is hard to do for other stars, they're also far away. But there are techniques. If you, if you employ several telescopes, uh, there's something called interferometry, which allows you to make these things act like one big telescope, and then you, you can look precisely enough to see that. Hasn't really been done yet, though. Here's one you may have seen in the papers a couple weeks ago. There was just, just an announcement. 
This is a really weird technique. Um, this is called gravitational lensing. And it's called microlensing because we're, we're lensing <laughs> what for astronomers are fairly low mass objects. Okay, the idea is you have some very distant star, like near the center of our galaxy. The light's coming towards us. And as it passes by some star in between, it, they're lined up so closely that the light is actually bent. Gravity bends light. It's actually bent by that star and focused on our telescope. So that this, the light from that star actually gets brighter as you focus it into the telescope. So you just watch the, the brightness of stars. The, the, you have to watch a couple million because this is a very unlikely event. You have to get two stars to line up almost exactly. Uh, but all the stars in the galaxy are moving around, and occasionally it happens. Uh, and so then when they line up, the star suddenly brightens up with this very characteristic shape. Now, if there's a planet there also, then the planet will also get lined up briefly and cause a focusing. And so you get a little spike on the main curve. This only lasts for a couple of days, whereas this lasts for a couple of months. So you have to be very organized, but people have done that. They've gotten networks of telescopes. When they see this start to happen, everybody gets on it, and they, they, you know, the telescopes are all around the world, so they're looking all the time. And recently they pulled this off and saw a spike due to a planet, and they claimed it was a five Earth mass planet. So that's kind of terrestrial. Uh, maybe it's terrestrial. Unfortunately, there are a couple of problems with this. One is it completely depends on your model of the galaxy. It turns, you know, you can't actually see these things. You just see the, the light get brighter. Uh, and so it, you're n we're not really sure about that. And the other problem with it is that alignment will never happen again. These stars are just moving by each other. So you can't confirm it. But, you know, there it is, and it's a way of, a way, you could, in principle, see Earth mass planets that way. So people are watching, and they may, but uh, like I said, you'll never be quite sure whether you saw it or not. So why not take a picture? Well, that's, that's pretty easy, actually. The, uh, the host star is at least a million times brighter than the planet, because planets don't really shine in, in visible light. They just reflect light from the star. And if you work it out, you, it's like looking for something that's a million times fainter than something else right next to it, because that's the other problem. Stars are very far away. It's like taking um, a quarter and looking for an eyelash on the president and moving the quarter you know, a couple hundred miles away. And now the, his nose is a million times brighter than his eyelash. And you want to see the eyelash. Pretty tough. Um, people still think they can do this. <laughs> uh, there, are, there are techniques which, in principle, might be able to do it. I, I can assure you they don't work yet. So there's another simple way to, to see planets. And this is the method that the Kepler mission is going to use. It's called transits. A transit is just like an eclipse. Only you don't cover up the whole star, you just cover up a small part of it, like that, like that, okay? Now that obviously requires you to be lined up so that when the planet comes in front of the star, it, it actually crosses the star. So that, that's not that likely. You can actually compute the likelihood of it. It depends on how big the star is. You know, the bigger that is, the more likely you're going to cross it. Uh, but it also depends on how close you are to the star, because you've got to get the angle right. So if you're a long way off, you tilt it a little bit, you miss. If you're close in, you know, you've you got more play with that. So it actually, it's very simple. The, the probability that you're going to see a transit is just the diameter of the star divided by the diameter of the orbit. So you can figure out what that is. For the Earth and the Sun, it's about half a percent. So if, if, if you look, you're looking for transits around other stars and you want to find truly Earth-like planets, true Earth analogs, then 199 out of 200 of them will not be lined up right so you can see it. Okay, so maybe you better look at 50,000. If you look at 50,000, then you, you should be able to see it. So that's the idea behind the Kepler mission. 
It's, it's pretty simple, actually. We just want to look at stars, and we want to see uh, a planet cross in front. Now, we can't get a picture of the stars, just like the direct imaging guys can't. They're, they're much too far away. Uh, but what we can do is measure the amount of light coming from the star. So when, when the planet's not there, the star has a, a certain amount of light. When the planet goes in front of it, it just cuts some of that out. When's that going to happen? Well, only when the planet actually crosses in front. The whole rest of the orbit, it's not going to happen. So that means you need to be watching all the time and you need to watch for a long time. If you, again, if you're talking about a true Earth analog, when, how often does this happen? Once a year, right? Only once a year will the Earth come in any particular direction. And how long does it take? It takes a few hours for the Earth to cr appear to cross the Sun. So you need to be watching, you, you, you want to make sure you don't miss those few hours during a year. But you can do it. Okay, so the, the, the amount of change in brightness is, is also very simple. It's just the relative areas of the planet and the star. The area of the planet divided by the area of the star gives you the amount of light that you're going to knock down. So Jupiter has 1% the area of the sun. It's a, a tenth the size, but well, it's area, so it's squared. So it's 1% effect. When Jupiter crosses in front of the sun, 1% of the sun's light is blocked. This is an actual picture of Venus crossing our sun. I don't know, some of you, I'm sure, noticed last June that this actually happened. From, from the Earth, you saw Venus crossing the sun. You might think, well, gee, that must happen all the time. But there's that orbital tilt business, and, and the Earth and the Venus have different tilts of their orbits. So it only happens twice every 180 years. So we were lucky. We, we got this nice picture for the Kepler mission, it's going to happen again in 2011, and then it's not going to happen again while you're alive. Okay, so don't. So you missed it last time, don't miss it next time. <laughs> um, so what's the area of Venus? Venus is the same size as the Earth. What's the area of Venus or the Earth compared to the Sun? Well, that's a hundredth of a percent, or one part in 10,000. So I need to measure the brightness of the star, better than that, right? That, that, this is the effect. The effect is one part in 10,000. I don't want noise that's also a part in 10,000 or I won't be able to tell. So I, I need precision basically of a part in 100,000. Well, the radio velocity guys needed precision of a part in 100 million, so they, they, they were worse off. Um, but this is not easy to do, but we think it's possible. Okay? To measure 0.01% changes in the light from a star, you can't do it from the ground. The Earth's atmosphere, well, it makes stars twinkle. I'm sure you've all noticed. The twinkling of stars is deadly. That, that's a huge effect compared to this. Um, so you, ca you can't really do this from the, from the ground. Very clever people can actually do a part in a thousand from the ground, but they can't do this. Okay, so you gotta go into space. That's why NASA is involved in this. Um, you also need to go into space because you want a high duty cycle, as I've explained. It's only going to happen for a few hours every year if, it, if it's a true Earth analog. And you don't want to miss it. So, you know, what are the problems if you do it from the ground? Well, the first big problem is day, daytime, right? That's terrible. Every, you know, every, every 24 hours, you, you have a bunch of hours where you can't measure the brightness of the star. That, that, that by itself makes transit experiments from the ground extremely, extremely um, sensitive to what the transit period is and, and so on. So they're, they're not very efficient. From space, you can watch all the time. So that's great. Okay, then the last thing is, okay, so how am I going to know that I saw a planetary transit? I'm going to see this dip of part in 10,000 in the light from the star, but I, uh, I'm on the project because stars have a tendency to do that anyway. They, they fluctuate by parts in more than 10,000 all the time. The sun is not fixed in its brightness to a part in 10,000. It has sunspots on it, it has flares, it has all this magnetic activity going on. Um, so how am I going to know that I saw a planetary transit? Well, if, I, if there's just one dip, I'm not going to know. 
Okay? I need at least three transits to happen, preferably four. And they need to exhibit exactly the same characteristics. They have to have the same brightness change, they have to have the same duration, and they have to occur strictly periodically, because it's supposed to be a planet in an orbit, so it better repeat exactly each time. So the first two transits give you a possible period, orbital period for the, but you have to test that, so you need a third one to test that, see if the two intervals are the same. If you have four, that's even better. So the Kepler mission is designed to actually try to detect true Earth analogs. So with Earth, it, it takes a year, so I need four years minimum, during which time I'm going to stare at the same stars without ever blinking, with extremely high precision, and um, I need lots of them because I'll miss almost all, all the Earths. So now you know how the Kepler mission is designed. Well, if I see transits, it's great. This is actually a real transit. This is real data. This is not as precise as Kepler. This is about 10 times less precise than Kepler will do. If you could see the numbers here, you'd see that uh, here's a 1% dip right here. So there's the, the light from the star without the transit comes down 1.5% and goes back up. This is a Jupiter-sized transit, because I said Jupiter was sort of 1%. Um, very beautiful data. If we see Jupiters, and we will, because I said there were lots of Jupiters close in to stars, Kepler will see those. We only need one of those. You can see that this is not as precise as Kepler. The shape of this thing is very characteristic. A star would never produce a curve like that on its own. So for Jupiters, we only need to see one transit. But for the other smaller planets, we need more. If you see it, you, got, you have the duration of the transit, the depth of the transit. That gives you the orbital period. Uh, the way, exact shape of this curve actually tells you where you cross the star. The curve changes if you cross the equator or you clip the, clip the pole or whatever. So we can actually tell where, where it crossed the star. And of course, the amount of the dip tells you how big the planet is. And then the orbital period tells you how big the orbit is. So you can tell I've got a planet that's uh, two Earth radii in size, and it's located uh, two-tenths of the distance of the Earth from the sun from this star. And uh, I know what the star is, too. So you, you get a fair amount of information. And if you have lots of those, then you can characterize what nature does about terrestrial planets. You can find out how many planets of a given size it makes, where does it tend to sprinkle them in the inner solar system, uh, what's the you know, likelihood of having an Earth-sized planet at a given distance. Uh, that's the, the point of the Kepler mission. So NASA funded this because this is really uh, right at one of NASA's goals. We'd like to place our solar system in context with other planetary systems. We'd like to figure out how our sun is related to other solar type stars and also other kinds of stars. But mostly we'd like to know uh, how many terrestrial planets are, are there out there because we're interested in this question. How much life is there out there? In order to have the kind of life that, we're, that we find on the Earth, we think we need something like a terrestrial planet to do that. You, need, you don't want a gas giant planet, you want a, a rocky or icy planet, and you want it to be a certain temperature, to be really Earth-like. Um, and in that case, all the people who are studying sort of the formation of life will know that they're not wasting their time. If the galaxy is full of planets that are the right size and the right distance from their star and so on, then that makes it very much more interesting to, to study the question of whether life uh, how, how common life's origin is. Okay, so the goals of the mission are to really find the frequency of terrestrial planets in the galaxy. That's the main goal of the mission. That is to say, if I pick a star out in the sky, what are the odds that it has terrestrial planets in the inner solar system? Okay. And we want to characterize the actual properties of inner solar systems, um, figure out how the properties of the stars determine whether they have planets or not, you already saw some indication of that. More metal-rich stars 
tend to have hot Jupiters. What about terrestrial planets? Do they tend to have those too? Or is it the opposite? Or what's the deal? Um, and in particular, we'd like to discover terrestrial planets that are in an interesting place. I mean, the other thing about these hot Jupiters is they're so close to the star that it's, you know, incredibly hot on the surface. Never, well, of course, there isn't really a surface. It's just gaseous. But anyway, it's incredibly hot. So they're not very interesting for life. Uh, but the, Kepler will find terrestrial planets that are interesting for life. They're the right temperature. And finally, detect true Earth analogs is sort of the, at the threshold of the mission's capabilities. If we don't see anything, that's also really interesting because I and most of my colleagues think we're going to see plenty. We're pretty sure that the universe makes lots of terrestrial planets and that we're going to be able to find them. If we don't see anything with Kepler, uh, that's going to be a paradigm shift. Suddenly the Earth is going to seem a lot more special. It will seem not so common in the galaxy. I don't know what people are, will make of that, but they will make something of it. So either way, we're either going to start feeling like there must be lots of company out there, or we're going to start feeling like, gosh, we're really special. We probably should not kill ourselves off. <laughs> probably we shouldn't kill ourselves off anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is the only way that we're going to get to this question in the next 10 or 20 years. So Kepler is uniquely qualified to, to answer this question. I, I borrowed this from President Kennedy. I, I'm not so, quite so sure anymore before this decade is out because NASA is beginning to uh, shift its priorities and, and start causing delays in the mission. But I, we think it'll be before the decade is out. Okay, I think I've described, well, I haven't given you the detail. It's, very, it's really very simple. So you have essentially a digital camera. It's, it's uh, one, meters, one meter across, so it's a, it's a telescope about like this. Uh, you put it up in space. Uh, you just put a whole bunch of CCDs in the focal plane. The CCD is the same thing that you have in your digital camera. These are, you know, big fancy ones, but that's pretty much what it is. It's just a big digital camera. You point it at a certain star field take a picture every 15 minutes for four years. <laughs> Same picture for four years. <laughs> Why do you do that? Well, in order to get a precision of a hundred, part in a hundred thousand on the brightness of the stars, you want to look at the same stars and average the brightness of hundreds of thousands of stars. You figure the average over hundreds of thousands of stars is nice and stable. Then you just compare the brightness of every star against that average. It's going to be launched on a delta. That's the really good news from the project's point of view. It's not going on the shuttle. So, so it actually has a chance of getting up there. Um, uh, this is not the launch of Kepler. It hasn't happened yet, okay, but it, it's like it. Uh, it's going to be in a kind of a funny orbit. You put it, it's not going to be orbiting Earth because we want everything to be really stable. We don't want the focal length of the telescope to change because the Earth shadows it and unshadows it, for example. So you put it in an orbit slightly bigger than the Earth's orbit, and then it slowly falls behind the Earth in this kind of curly, curly Q pattern and is, is very stable thermally. Where is it going to look? Well, you could pick anywhere. You'd like to pick a, a star field that has a lot of stars in it. That, that would be a good thing uh, because, as you saw, we're, we're pretty inefficient as far as planetary angles are concerned. So, so for every planet that we detect, we're going to up our frequency by the inefficiency factor. You know? So if I detect a, a planet at 1 AU, I'll say, well, that planet actually represents 200 planets that I missed because the rest of them weren't lined up right. Okay? So you, you, you pick a field, like near the Milky Way, that would be a good, good field to pick. Um, and then there are constraints on how you point the spacecraft. You don't want it pointing at the sun. You do want the solar panels pointing at the sun. And that restricts where you can look in the sky. So the, the net result is that it's pointing in a place that you all can see. Um, those of you who know the summer triangle, or the constellation of uh, Lyra, or the star of Vega, or the northern cross, Cygnus, the Milky Way runs right, right down here. 
that's where we're looking. So this is high in, high in the sky in the summertime. Um, and here are the CCD chips as projected onto the sky. So you can see we have uh, 20, 21 chips that will be looking at several hundred thousand stars in, in this area. The air, it's a wide field telescope. If you put your hand up and cover part of the sky, that's pretty much how big a patch of sky Kepler looks at. Those of you who know telescopes will know that's a very large field of view for a telescope. And then how are we going to do it? Stars vary all the time, so the strict periodicity of the transits is going to be our main filter for deciding whether we have something real or not. Um, basically what's shown here, uh, you, I don't need to go into the details, I'll just, this is the actual signal from the sun uh, looking for periodic events. Okay, if you have a periodic event, you, you go up this axis. The red is just the sun by itself. The blue is exactly the same signal, except we insert a transit every 360, degree day, 360 days of an Earth-like planet. So we have the actual stellar noise from the sun, and we put in the transit, and then you use very clever software that searches for all possible orbital periods, folds the signal to all periods, to see whether there's some repeating signal in there. And you can see that it sticks out like a sore thumb. Those of you who know statistics, uh, this is three sigma um, significance. That, that doesn't count in this experiment because we're looking at so many stars and so many possible orbital periods. To be really significant, we need to be up at seven or eight sigma. This is an 11 sigma result. <laughs> okay, so. Those of you who can appreciate statistics will understand this is highly significant. Plus, you'll see the harmonics of it. So we don't think we'll, we'll be fooled by stellar noise. If a planet's really doing it, it's going to repeat with extreme periodicity. But this means that we're more sensitive to, to more repetitions. And that makes Kepler more sensitive to inner planets than outer planets, because inner planets just go around faster. So we'll see more transits for inner planets. So when you, when you compute all the noise sources and all your problems and so on, this is the bottom line for, for Kepler, more or less. This is the number of planets you would detect if every star had the given type of planet. But they were oriented all kinds of different ways and you had all your, your problems with your instrument and so on. Okay, so it's our best guess. So these are upper limits. That is, say, if every star had a... So let's just do it. So, for a true Earth analog, that's at 1 AU, uh, and it's um, 1 Earth size. Okay, so here's 1 AU and 1 Earth size right there. You go over here to read off how many planets you should see. This is a logarithmic scale, so it's something like uh, 30 planets. That's, that's taking the full number of stars Kepler's looking at, and all these inefficiencies and so on, and, and our detectability and stellar noise and all the rest of it. Okay, so we don't expect to see 30 true Earth analogs, because that would mean every star in the sky has one. So if we don't see any, that means less than a 30th of them have true Earth analogs. But that's not the, the main question that Kepler's after. The main question Kepler is after is how many terrestrial planets are out there? And as you've seen, we already had a lot of Jupiters that were in close to the star. We, sh we, sh we didn't expect them. We do expect terrestrial planets to be close to the star, like Mercury or closer. And Kepler's efficiency goes up like crazy. So if I look, instead of at one AU, I look at a third of an AU, that's where Mercury is, and I have Earth-sized planets. If every star had an Earth-sized planet, I'd get a thousand detections with Kepler. Okay, so now if I see none at that orbital period, it means less than one in a thousand stars has such a thing. So that's how this works. You notice in the inner solar system, these numbers are all big. It, we can even detect Mars if it is in where these hot Jupiters are. Why? Because it'll go around every four days. And we'll watch for four years. So we'll just build up the statistics. Even though an individual dip isn't very deep, you know, after you add up 200 of them, uh, you can see them. So Kepler is quite sensitive to terrestrial planets in inner solar systems. If Kepler doesn't see anything, 
there aren't any terrestrial planets out there, at least not in the inner part of the solar systems. So in that sense, it is going to answer this, this basic question about rocky planets. I've painted a reasonably rosy picture so far, I, I have to be honest. There are, there are ways that we can get fooled, and then there are ways we can try to unfool ourselves. Um, so let's say you, know, you, have, you, you pass all your tests. You have a dip that's the right, right uh, amount of drop. It's strictly periodic. Um, you don't know anything else uh, that would cause it. Is that a planet? Well, not necessarily. Uh, for, one, for one thing, there are a lot of binary stars in the sky where one star goes around another. Suppose it just clips, clips the star, and then it'll just have a little dip. <laughs> okay, that might look like a planet. Um, but it turns out if it just clips it like that, when you have a real transit, you know, the thing gets, starts blocking the star, and then here it blocks the same amount, here it blocks the same amount, here it blocks the same amount, and then it comes out again. So you, you come down and then you have some period of time where it's blocking more or less the same amount. If you just clip it like that, then you get more of a V-shaped curve. So that's one way to tell. Okay? Now here's another one, though. Suppose I have a, a, a small star that's in orbit around a really big star. There are giant stars out there and supergiant stars, which are much bigger than the sun. So I could put the sun in orbit around a supergiant that would look like a terrestrial planet in orbit around a sun, if I didn't know what I was doing. Right? So those would be completely fooling you. It means you have to go check the star. Okay? You have to find out whether it's actually a giant or supergiant. We can do that. We have to observe it from the ground. We have to take a spectrum. But we can do that. So anything that looks like it has a planet, we have to go make that test, make sure it's not a giant or supergiant. Then there are dead stars. Dead stars like the sun, for example, when it dies, what it's going to leave is a white dwarf. The white dwarf is going to be the size of the Earth. So here's an Earth-sized object. It could be in a binary system, could transit uh, in front of the other star, and then you'd think that might fool you. It turns out, though, that, that there's no problem there. There's, here's that microlensing thing again. So the, the white dwarf comes in front of the star. It actually focuses the light from the star towards us. And rather than giving you a dip, it actually makes it go up. So OK, th those won't fool us. There are a couple of cases, though, that, that are more difficult. Um, one is if you have, you have a binary star, but it's really far away. So it's very faint. But you know, you got two stars, and they, they actually eclipse each other. So you get a, a good-sized eclipse like that. But the light level there is very low. You think you're looking at, at a foreground star. In other words, if I put the, put the background binary right behind the other star, I might not be able to tell that my telescope's looking at two different things. So now I, I have this bright star, which is constant, and I add to it this faint star that has an eclipse, and what do I get? I get a little transit signal. OK, that, that one's tougher, because I said they're so lined up I can't tell that I have two different stars there. Well, OK. So maybe then I need to go with the Hubble Space Telescope or use some other technique to really, really be very careful about um, trying to resolve the two stars. Kepler itself, in fact, has some ability to do that if we get a lot of transits. So you can see whether the center of the light actually tends to shift slightly when the transit occurs. That means you have a, a, a slightly misaligned background source. Um, Kepler is actually good enough at that that the, the, the number of systems that'll still be too lined up for us to tell is rather small. So the way we're going to get out of this is if we only get a few terrestrial signals, we're not going to be able to be sure <laughs> that they weren't false positives. If we get the number we're expecting, the number that could be false positives would be low, and nobody will care. You can get the same kind of thing if you have a triple star system with two small stars and one bright star, and they eclipse. Okay? But that's also pretty unlikely. So the, the bottom line on these hard false positives is if we only get a few detections, they're going to be hard. <laughs> and if we get a bunch of detections, they're not going to bother us. For the last little bit, I want to just talk about this question of habitability. 
So why is Kepler particularly interesting? The, the planets that we've been finding so far are not habitable for two reasons. One, they're gas giants in the first place, and two, they are uh, usually in bad places. I mean, there's some of them that are kind of at the right distance, but they're gas giants. So what is the right distance? I, I don't like this term habitable zone myself. It implies that we understand what habitable zones are. All that's really meant by that is that you can have liquid water on the surface, like the Earth. I mean, that does sound like a nice thing to have, but we've learned from astrobiology that there are other ways to have life that don't require liquid surface water. Well, never mind that. You know, when, when we start announcing results and you see them in the paper, you're not going to be so interested unless, you know, it really seems like an Earth-like planet that can have w liquid water on the surface, oceans, lakes, and so on. So fine. What kind of planets can have that? Well, it depends on the star, okay? Stars come in different masses. So for the sun, uh, well, what's the habitable zone? Well, that turns out to be a little tricky, too. So, so people draw the habitable zone uh, so that Mars is just outside one part of it and Venus is just inside the other part of it because neither Mars nor Venus seem all that habitable to us. That, that's not really very good. If you, for example, swapped Mars and Venus in place, they'd both be a lot more habitable because then the Mars would have a nice atmosphere and Venus would not have such a thick atmosphere and it wouldn't have this terrible greenhouse effect. So I'm not sure we completely know what we're talking about there either, but you can compute what the temperature of a planet will be at a given distance from a given star. And that, this is what you get. So for more massive stars, the habitable zones are further out because it's hotter, right? Uh, and they're also bigger. For little stars, here's one with uh, half the mass of the sun, the habitable zones are close to the star because it's not very bright. It's a, it's a little faint, cool star. You have to cuddle up to it before you can be warmed up enough. Um, and it's, it's a small zone. So people, for various reasons, people have not thought about these stars as being very important. They haven't thought about these stars as being very important either because these stars don't live very long. Stars like this live for a billion years or less. And that also doesn't seem like a long enough time for us to be really interested. Okay. What I want to say is that that's a bit of a mistake. So the zone that Kepler is sensitive to covers the habitable zone. Here's the habitable zone for stars of different masses. So for the little stars, it's in close, and for the bigger stars, it's out further. But Kepler really has all that covered. So we'll pick up all the planets in, in this zone here. And I, I want to, my last point, which is kind of a new one that people are just beginning to make now, is you shouldn't dismiss the small, cool stars so quickly. First of all, uh, there are way more of them than there are anything else. If you look at the 120 stars closest to the sun, uh, they stack up like this. So stars that are hotter than the sun are these, three of them. Stars that are like the sun are the yellow ones. Stars that are somewhat cooler than the sun are these orange ones. And these cool ones that are half a solar mass or less are the great bulk of the stars near us. You don't know that because they're all so faint, you can't see any of them. The, the very closest star to the sun is one of these, Proxima Centauri. You can't see it with your naked eye because it's just too faint. So people have had this psychological <laughs> you know, barrier against these stars because you, you can't even see them. You know, why should you worry about them? Um, but there are many more of them than anything else, so you ought to think about it, okay? So there are many more of them. What's the next thing? Well, you can look at the habitable zone. Remember, I threw away these hot stars because they don't live long enough. What's the story with these small stars? A half solar mass star lives 100 billion years. That's 10 times longer than our sun. And as you go down in mass, uh, it lives even longer. It's, it's kind of paradoxical, because you would think it's a smaller star, it has less fuel, but it's faint, and it's, so it's not burning its fuel. It's a, it's a fuel-efficient star, okay? Um, so it lives a long time. Uh, these, the lowest, a tenth of a solar mass star lives trillions of years. 
That means you can take a long time to get life started there. You've got, got all the time in the world. Remember, the universe is only 13 billion years old. So every small star that was, has ever been made is in its infancy still. The, and from their point of view, the universe is extremely young still. Another thing, these inner giant planets that we've been finding, they seem to be much less common around these little stars. There's probably less material in the disk. That's good because the last thing you want to have habitable terrestrial planets is to have some big planet right in your habitable zone. That will for sure throw out all the terrestrial planets. You won't have any terrestrial planets left in those systems. So that's good. Also, wet planets are probably more likely because the, the star is so cool that uh, you don't have to go very far before you get into the snow zone in the, in the disk. So you have lots of comets and volatile planetesimals just outside the habitable zone. You, you hardly have to move them at all to get them in there, unlike our solar system. And finally, they're easier to find, especially by Kepler. Um, you know, the, they have short period orbits. You have to bring them up close to the star. Uh, also, the star is smaller. And remember, the ratio of the area of the planet to the area of the star is what matters. So Kepler is exquisitely sensitive to habitable planets around these cool stars. They're called M stars by, uh, by astronomers. And those will be the first habitable planets that we'll announce because they have short periods. So we have to wait. It's there by the available area especially since there are a lot more of these. The available, available air, planet, habitable area in the universe around M stars is much bigger than, than solar type stars. The main issue has been that the planets are so close to the star that they get locked onto the star like our moon is locked onto the Earth. So the planet keeps one face towards the star all the time and the other face is never towards the star. And people have said, oh, how could that be habitable? But it's actually very easy. Uh, if you're going to have a habitable planet, you better have an atmosphere. And if you have enough of an atmosphere like the one we have here, it'll redistribute the heat from the, the sun side or the star, starlit side to the dark side. Venus is a good example. Venus barely rotates, and it's the same temperature everywhere. Um, so that's not really a problem, actually. Then people think of these little stars as, as having extremely high energy radiation coming from them. Because in the first billion years, uh, they do. Um, but that's just the first billion years. Remember, they live 100 billion years minimum. So it's only a tenth of a percent to one percent of the life of the star where you might have to worry about this. And then I go back to this one. Half the planet is totally protected because it never sees the star. The star can do whatever it wants to the front side. The back side is perfectly OK. Now, on the, the, you know, on the final con is it's going to be hard to see these things. If you want to actually study the planets more directly, they're right up against the M stars, so that's not great. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of M stars are pretty close to us, so that helps split them out again. Bottom line, I don't know, but I, don't, I certainly think we shouldn't be dismissing these stars, and I certainly think Kepler is going to, going to they're, they're going to be in the news. You're going to hear about it. I'll, I'll make a bet. We'll see, we'll, see, we'll see if I win or not. So, to summarize, we're going to be detecting terrestrial planets. We're going to be doing it by transits. The Kepler mission is going to do it. And right now the launch date is the is, uh, middle of 2008. It was actually October 2007 until a few months ago. And it's only slipping for budgetary reasons. It's such a simple experiment. There's really no, nothing technical uh, stopping it. The main result, I think, will be that we'll have transits of thousands of terrestrial planets, the ones that are in inner orbits, because Kepler's very sensitive to those. And from that, we'll be able to say what the frequency of terrestrial planets around other stars is. If you want to go out to the same distance as the Earth, uh, the numbers are much less. And they depend, you know, we're, we're more sensitive to planets that are bigger than smaller. We don't really know how planets are redistributed in, in radius. Although the radial velocity people have picked up a one planet that actually did transit. And that one is kind of at the two, two Earth radius um, size, which puts it at sort of seven or eight 
Earth masses. But it's, they only pick them up when they're super close. So it's, it's got a you know, three-day orbit. <laughs> so it's incredibly roasted, not, not habitable at all. But the Kepler ones will be. Um, there are a couple of other things we might see. Uh, we might actually see the, the giant inner planets. You can actually see their phases. Kepler is sensitive enough to light that it can tell if the planet is full or crescent going around the star. And then there'll be maybe around 100 giant planets that we actually see transiting their stars as well. And those are very nice because then you get the size of the planet, you get the mass of the planet, you get the density, all kinds of information. So those will be quite interesting as well. I, I remind you that all these numbers uh, are going to be less because they all assume that most stars have terrestrial planets. So what Kepler really will tell you is the closer you come to this, the bigger the fraction of stars with terrestrial planets. But I think, you know, by 2010, you know, as long as uh, the budget allows, uh, we will know the answer to the question of how many Earths are there out there. And I think people will find that pretty interesting. Thank you. This mic, yeah, good. So there's a microphone here and a microphone over there and one up above. And if anybody has to leave, we're taking photographs of people who know. Really, right, hopefully don't <laughs> exit it. We're trying to discourage exiting it. This is a 90-minute program. So the guy over on the left, go. Yep. Anybody who's exiting, be quiet. Thank you. Maybe, maybe we could get a little bit of house lights so I can actually see people. Yeah. It does a... Uh uh, the intensity of the light of a star not vary a little, so that would be difficult to make a precise uh, measurement of the intensity. You, are you asking how much of a problem the variability of the star is going to be? Yeah. Yeah, so as I said, that's actually my role in this project. Uh, the sun varies by um, a part in... in a thousand instead of a part in ten thousand. Sometimes it varies by a few parts in a hundred. So the, the solar signal is in fact much bigger than the transit signal. So you might think that was a terrible problem. And, and in fact, people worried about that. That's how I got involved. There are two things that, that save you. One is that most of the solar variability it occurs because magnetic regions come and go on the sun. They, they don't do that in a few hours. So the, the, although you get a big variation, it is slow compared to the transit time scale. That's one, that's one good thing. But the main thing is what I said earlier, the strict periodicity of the planet. So whatever the sun does, and however squirrely the signal looks, it's not going to repeat exactly one orbital period later. And this software uh, has been developed by signal processing people and tested very carefully uh, against all kinds of contingencies for stellar variability. It's very good at picking out small dips that are very periodic in a signal that sort of goes all over the place. So that, that's what we're counting on mostly. Uh, but it's, it's also fortunate that the, the sun and the stars tend not to vary on the transit time scales. I mean, they do a little bit of it, but most of the really ugly stuff happens more slowly than, than bothers us. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, not to introduce a negative point, but... Um, <laughs> That's fine, negative I'm points. going to anyway. Um, we've, we're all familiar with the problems that we, that we had with the Hubble Space Telescope. Also, between now and 2008 or 2010 or whenever Kepler takes off, has there been any provision? What kind of fail-safes are there? And I, I understand it's already being built. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Um, is there any provision for uh, change in technology or...? Well, no. <laughs> that's, that's the trouble with space missions. You have to plan them well in advance. You have to fix everything. You have to contract it out, get it in, test it, and so on. 
there's really no provision for changes in technology. Uh, we, we already have purchased all of our CCDs. We've tested them. They work. We've purchased our mirror. It's been polished. It's good. Uh, the electronics are being tested. So we're pretty far along, actually. The spacecraft is you know, in assembly uh, at this point. Uh, we don't want to change any, anything. <laughs> as soon as you change anything, you have to worry about all the, all the effects of that. Uh, I, I can say that, that uh, this week there was a flurry of, of, of emails uh, between the project people because NASA said, yeah, you know, we, we'd like to spend a little less money on this. How about if you don't, um, how about if your high gain antenna that sends the data back to the Earth isn't on a, on a movable arm so that it can point at the Earth? Why don't we just stick it on the spacecraft and then, and then make the spacecraft point? <laughs> And they said, well, and we'll give you more memory so you only have to do that once a month. So that's the kind of thing that we have to deal with. You know, the whole point of Kepler, of course, is to, to, to look as continuously as possible and not to, to do that. Uh, you know, but it's only 24 hours every month. You know, what's the acceptable risk? And, you know, how bad is that going to impact us? And, and my worry is when we do that and then come back 24 hours later, are we sure we're going to get lined up again so that we don't have to recalibrate everything? Because that, that would be very annoying. So, so my position on that kind of thing is don't mess with it. You know, find the money somewhere else. <laughs> you know, why ruin one of, the, one of the most exciting missions that you're going to, you're going to do? But NASA is kind of in a tizzy right now with the, the space station problems, the shuttle problems, the president's exploration initiative. All the priorities are shifting around. Kepler is one of the few fortunate experiments that everybody thinks is really a good idea, it's not so hard, and let's do it. But, um, but budget's always an issue. So, so that's my worry, not, not technical changes. Thank you. Yep, up above um, there. When this CCD moves uh, with the digital camera, couldn't it mess up the data? Like, for the curly cues, how do you make sure that the picture you're viewing is the same picture that you see? the whole entire four years, since it's a really long time period, couldn't the air, f the room for air be really large? Well, that's actually a good question, uh, because if you want to do photometry to a part in 100,000, you don't want anything to move or change or anything. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. So we, want, we, want, we don't want the stars shifting around on the CCD by more than a fraction of one pixel. And if it does move, we want to know exactly how it moved. And we want to know exactly how all the pixels respond to this movement of a tenth of a pixel in that direction. Uh, so the spacecraft has very careful pointing, um, both hardware and software on it. You know, we can point the Hubble Space Telescope very accurately and hold it that way. Kepler, and, and the Hubble keeps, you know, changing where it's looking and still can do that. Kepler is simpler, it's just <laughs> going to stare at one thing and stay that way. And so you can, you can keep comparing your picture to the previous picture and ask, did anything change? And if it changed, you can put it back. Uh, so there's, there are very fine controls uh, on the Kepler pointing so that we hope that it doesn't drift hardly at all. And, and, you know, and there are side, side detectors that sort of keep track just of where the, the thing is pointing. Uh, but if it does change, you have about a million, a hundred million CCD pixels, many of which have stars in them. So if you moved by even a hundredth of a pixel, you have a hundred thousand data points that you can test that with. And so we, we, we believe that we will understand exactly uh, how Kepler is pointing all the time. Even, you know, there's no, nothing that's perfect. It'll have, it will have some tiny jitter to it, but we think we can correct for that. And because we're looking at the same stars all the time on the same pixels, we'll understand what happens to the brightness as, as you drift the star a tiny amount across the pixel. That's the sort of thing you have to worry about if you're going to do 100,000 photometry. But it uh, should be controllable. OK, I've got a, a question on a card. How do planets get formed out of the dust clouds? Yep, that's how they get formed. Um, so between the stars, you have a lot of, well, it's not, actually, you don't have a lot. You have, you have a tiny amount of, of gas, which adds up to a lot if you 
start adding it up over light years. Um, and then, the, and that gas is hydrogen and helium gas. About 1% of that mass you have in more solid material. Uh, little tiny carbon grains, little graphite grains, little silicate grains, little ice grains. That they come actually off of stars uh, when stars are, are, are dying. They, they get very cold, they begin to shed their outer atmospheres, and those things condense out into these dust grains. That's the raw material out of which the planets are made. So, so then this stuff all just goes out and floats between the stars, and the galaxy turns and the stars move around, and the, the, the stuff swirls, and sometimes it collects up into a more dense cloud, as, like the clouds you saw in, the, in those pictures. If it gets dense enough, then gravity can begin to try to collapse it. And that's when, uh, when you get the star forming, and, and as the star forms, a disk has to appear around it because there's spin involved, and then the planets can form in the disk. So that, that's the basic story. Yeah. Um, thanks for your presentation, great. Um, how can the ordinary average student convince policymakers to please film, you know, Kepler the sequel? <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, it's interesting. I had a question like that from a student this afternoon as well. The Congress and the President say the right things. They say they're interested in all this. They say they're going to double the NSF budget. They say they want to do science with NASA, but they don't do it. <laughs> you know, a lot of other considerations come into play. And the budget process is very complicated and very political and very irrational. So that although people say that they want to accomplish something, they don't get it done. And I don't know what to tell them except believe yourselves. You know, they say the right words, they just don't implement them. So that the more the public asks for that, or even better, the more the public votes people in who will be more rational, uh, the more that'll happen. Dr. Bosri, we heard you make mention of the generally accepted uh, age of the universe from the Big Bang of maybe 13 billion, maybe 15 billion. I have read in science publications that there is apparently objects have been observed that are anomalous and appear to have an age greater than that number of billions of years. Uh, that is, objects that appear to be older than the universe itself. Is, is that correct? And what do you make of such a statement? Well, it, it used to be correct, actually. Uh, it was correct eight years ago. We, we really actually had a conundrum. Uh, the, the oldest stars, according to the best models of stars, seemed to be older than the age of the universe as determined by the expansion of the universe. That, that conundrum got fixed when dark energy was discovered. So the, the, the age of the universe now is inferred to be a little older than the oldest stars. Everything, everything is fine. So it was a big surprise to, to find out that the universe is actually expanding and accelerating. But when we didn't know that it was accelerating, we got this paradox. You know, everybody was doing everything right except they, they didn't have that term in there. And so it ye yielded these paradoxical results. Now that's not, not there anymore. Now we have a different paradox, which is why is there dark energy? But, but at least, <laughs> at least we know, you know, at least that one, at least that one is not so mysterious as why are some objects older than the universe? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very simple. Uh, would it? I know it sounds kind of like a movie nerd person, but um, would it be possible to uh, extend the range of? habitable planets by making artificial things? Yeah. I, I don't know what you mean. Uh, just... You mean in terms yeah, like, of... Like in those really old black and white movies. You mean in terms of habitability? <laughs> yeah. Building uh, our own space colonies? Uh, doing something. Yeah, um, well, that's, not, that's <laughs> probably... It's probably easier than going to these habitable planets that I'm talking about. Uh, at some level, but I think, you know, a, m a much easier solution to the population problem on the Earth, for example, would be to have less people, <laughs> rather than trying to build new planets or send them out somewhere else. <laughs> but, you know, we'll, we'll do what we're going to do. That's, that's 
Well, I was, uh, what I was really wondering was, um, could we make more planet? Would it be possible to increase the ratio of finding habitable planets by adding some things that that planet didn't have? Finally, I found the words. Okay. I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not quite okay, sure. I know what you mean. Sure. I'm sorry. There. <laughs> See, they're smarter than me. <laughs> terraforming. Oh, terraforming. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Um, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> In principle, uh, I th so I'll, I'll, I'll retranslate your question the way I'm now understanding it. Wouldn't it be easier to, to uh, would it be easier to make Thanks. more planets in our solar system habitable rather than trying to find other habitable planets and go to them? First of all, let me say that this whole business of habitability is not, we're not really interested in going there. Uh, this is more the question of how much life is there out in the universe. So. When I say habitable planets, I don't really mean habitable by humans. I just mean inhabited by, by some kind of life. Uh, as far as terraforming the planets in our solar system is concerned, I think it's, Mars is a, is a possible site for terraforming. First thing we got to do is go there and make very sure that there's not already life there. It would be pretty nasty of us to terraform Mars if there were already Martians of some sort. Uh, but if it, if it turns out to be a sterile planet, then I guess we're, we're free to do it. Uh, and I think the only way to accomplish terraforming in a, in a uh, feasible way is going to be possible in one or two hundred years, which is to bioengineer organisms that can live on Mars as, as it currently is, but whose waste products turn it into more like a planet that we like. So, for example, organisms that munch on the Martian rocks and release the oxygen back into the atmosphere, or which, are, which like to live on the polar caps but are very dark and so heat those up and cause them to evaporate. You can do stuff like that. You can also uh, divert comets and have them hit Mars. Of course, you wouldn't want to be there when that was happening and get a lot more water and, and air on Mars and so on. So yeah, I think it's, it's not out of the question, but that's, that's a very different sort of project than, than what we're talking about right now. There was recently uh, an article in the New York Times about uh, computer altered computer altered pictures of nebulas and such. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Well, all all the pictures I showed you almost are computer altered. Okay, the uh, the truth is that I mean, if if by altered you mean it doesn't look the way your eye would see it, um, some things were removed and added, brightened. Well, yeah. So people do. Uh, brighten things, they change the colors, they change the contrast. Uh, they do all that to bring out details that you otherwise wouldn't see. Uh, it turns out that nebulae are so faint uh, and it doesn't do any good to look at them through bigger telescopes either because a big telescope just, you know, it, it gathers more light but then it spreads it out more too. So your eye sees the same surface brightness. Uh, ne all nebulae are too faint for your color cones to, to register anything. So you, will never, you would never see, even if you went to the nebula, you still wouldn't see those colors. Your eyes actually don't work that well. So astronomers don't feel badly at all about enhancing pictures to show you stuff that your eye can't see. I mean, after all, a telescope shows you stuff your eye can't see in the first place. Uh, and we, we operate at infrared wavelengths and x-rays and so on, all kinds of stuff your eye can't do. So many, probably maybe even most, pictures that you see uh, of astronomical objects have been enhanced somehow. And nobody's trying to hide anything or fool anybody. It's just, it looks a lot better and you can see a lot more about the object if, if we enhance them. And we don't, we don't pretend that that's how it would look if you were there. Thanks. Over here. Yes, any system, I, I, I'm looking for comments here, and any system that you use to detect planets is going to be much more likely to detect the large gas giants. Right. I'm assuming we're detecting a fair number of them, some of them anyways, in the habitable zone? That's right. Currently, um, I, I, had, me, I showed the distribution okay. up there. You know, some number of those were in the, quote, habitable zone. But of course, they're not uh, terrestrial planets, so people don't think of them as habitable. But if we look at our own solar system, and we look at our gas giants, there's a lot of rocks floating around those gas giants. It seems likely to me that if we're seeing gas giants in habitable zones, we're already seeing where 
habitable smaller planets orbiting the gas giant probably already exist. How That's on earth we would observe that, I have no idea to prove it, but it seems likely. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, you're absolutely right. So it's possible that around these inner gas giants, there are rocky moons, even Earth-sized moons, like the moon Endor in uh, Star Wars. That's, that's entirely possible. Uh, and those would be in the habitable zone. Uh, and actually, it is observable with transits again. So if, if you have a, a giant planet that transits a star, and it has a rocky moon that's the size of the Earth with it, and then you get an extra transit signal, especially when it comes and goes. You see the, the planet, you know, the giant planet comes in, and then the rocky planet comes in and knocks a little more light out. Then the giant planet leaves, and then the rocky planet leaves and gets the last little bit back. So it's detectable. Do you think it, Kepler could detect that? Yeah. Actually, the HST observation that I showed you would have detected an Earth-sized moon around that planet. And, and the, the authors said so. They had a sufficient sensitivity even in that observation to do that. So Thank you. That's so it's quite exciting. plausible. And we may turn them up. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Um, would the presence of moons around these terrestrial planets and, and their orbits and where they were affect the signal in any way that would prevent Kepler from making a judgment? No. Uh, if, if the moon is substantially smaller than the planet, then its effect on the signal is substantially smaller as well. If it was a, a double planet or something, then yes, that would. Um, you know, we'll, we'll look at the signal, especially if, if it repeats. Now, you know, if, if you have a moon going around a planet, the likelihood is the next time the planet comes around, the moon will be in a different place. So that would look like noise on your transit signal. We might not be able to tell that. But in principle, uh, you know, if you had two you know, similarly sized bodies, and you saw them in the same configuration more than once, you, you might see it. So we'll just, we'll just be looking. We'll, you know, we'll see what the transit signals look like. I should, I should emphasize that the terrestrial planet signals are a part in 10,000, and our precision is a couple parts in 100,000. So the ones which only occur a few times, we're really not going to have enough signal to noise to see something like that. But the short period ones that repeat 100 times, uh, we might well be able to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, let's, just do, let's do one more on each side, and then I've got to go. Okay, so we're just going to do one, one, and that's it. I'll, I'll stick around after if you want to ask me more. Yes? Um, you said that uh, Kepler focuses on one spot and keeps constant on that spot. And you also said that Kepler, in order to work, would have to examine thousands of stars. Right. So I'm assuming they're all in that spot. Yeah, I, I showed you the, um, I guess this went yeah. to sleep, huh? Well, how, how do you distinguish what light's coming from what stars? Oh, it, it's an actual picture. So you, you have a picture of the star field. You can measure the brightness of each star in that star field. But so, wouldn't the stars interfere with each other? Uh, at some level, okay, so that, that's, a, that's a reasonable question. So if you look at the Milky Way, of course, there's, there's a whole haze of faint stars. Um, so Kepler is going to concentrate on stars that are relatively bright. They're not bright compared to what you're used to, but they're bright, they're bright compared to this sort of background haze of stars. So we will be able to pick out, and in fact, we actually have to pick out each of our target stars. We have to decide ahead of time, before launch, we have to actually decide you know, which 120,000 stars we're actually going to look at because the data rate isn't high enough to download the entire picture every 15 minutes. As I said, there are something like 100 million CCD pixels in the Kepler field. So we're gonna, we, we actually pick out 35 around each of our target stars. We've chosen our target stars, hopefully, not to be giants and supergiants. And they're much brighter than anything else near them. So we'll be able to distinguish them that way. Thank you. OK, last question. Sure. Um, <coughs> if you uh, find stars that you're interested in from Kepler, what kind of improvements have to be made in spectrographs to, uh, to actually take a spectrum of the star, and in particular, its planet? Uh, spectrum of the star is easy, because as, as I said, these are relatively bright. And in fact, we're, we're taking spectra of, of possible right. targets I, already. The planet's another matter. Uh, basically, we're not. You're not going to be able to do that. The, the average Kepler star is going to be a few hundred light years away. 
<coughs> and that's really too far to ever have a hope of separating the ter terrestrial planets. Okay. So Kepler, what Kepler is going to do is tell us the frequency of terrestrial planets. That information is then going to be fed to mission planners who want to image planets. So if, if every tenth star has a terrestrial planet, you don't have to look out very far before you're going to find some. If every thousandth star has a terrestrial planet, you, you have to plan that your imaging device is going to have to look pretty far away before it's going to see anything. So this is important information. But the actual planets that Kepler finds, I'm afraid, will never be, <laughs> never be studied further other than the transits. Thank you very much for your questions. <laughs> okay, so I have a question I have one question and I would like to ask permission in advance to ask a follow up question depending on your answer. Sure. <laughs> okay. um, I'm easy. What, what are the prospects for direct um, extra solo planetary observation? Direct imaging, you mean? Yes. Well, in some sense, it's already happened. Uh, there have been three claims of images of extrasolar planets already. They all involve uh, very young uh, gas giant planets. Um, one was uh, about 150 <coughs> light years away in the, the TW Ohio Association, and other ones in, I mean, they're all in star forming regions. The, the point being that when a planet, when a ga especially when a gas giant just forms, it's actually pretty bright. It's not. It's as bright as a as a very faint regular star. Uh, it's shining because of gravitational accretion. You know, it's still hot, hot, hot and puffed up. The the issue has been, and I've been involved in this. The the issue is, okay, they got a picture, uh, and and I. <laughs> I said this before they got the pictures. I said, you know, we're studying these brown dwarfs. They keep getting lower and lower in mass. Uh, they're the same temperatures as young giant planets are going to be. Uh, and we can, and they're isolated. We can take a spectrum. We're studying their atmospheres. I'm not sure what the point is of getting, you know, the first image of one of these young extrasolar planets because we can study the, we can study these other objects better. And the only difference between them is basically the surface gravity is lower on the, on the planet. So, so about three of these images have already been obtained. And the issue has been, are these actually planets? <coughs> so that depends on, um, it depends on models, basically. You, you have a model for how bright the thing ought to be at a certain age or what temperature it should be. Uh, and these models are fairly untested. And this is actually an area of my research. We've been testing the models on the brown dwarfs and find that they, they have problems. Uh, and so when people claim that they actually have a planet that they're image, imaging, um, there are questions about that, shall we say. So, but whether they're planets or not, you know, they, they're, they're young, very cool, uh, very low luminosity objects, and so they've been imaged. So that, maybe that's not probably the point of your question. The point, point of your question is probably, when are we going to image planets that, that aren't pretty bright by themselves? The web follow up. It would appear that masking technology is necessary. Um, well, there's, there are various techniques. Masking is one of them. So if you want to take an image of a planet in reflected light, for example, you've got to suppress the light of the star by a factor of a million in the infrared and even more in the optical. Um, so one, one, one way to do that is to try to just put a mask in front of the star. That doesn't really work for planets in, in an interesting separation range because the mask is going to be too big. So, they, so there are various ideas about how to, how to get around that. One is called nulling interferometry. <coughs> so you, you set up an interferometer 
so that the interference fringes from the star are dest destructively interfering, but the planet is not. So the star cancels itself off. If you, if you do it really right and you don't have any scattered light in your system or your scattered light is down by a factor of a million, uh, then you can essentially get the star to disappear. One of the images that I didn't show, I had, I had them stuck at the end of my slideshow, but I didn't, didn't have time, um, is a simulation of that. So the star is basically gone, and you get, uh, you get double images of each planet, so you can kind of tell where they are around there. That's one idea. There was just a new idea that came out in uh, Nature a couple of weeks ago uh, about called the Optical Vortex. <laughs> And I, and I must confess, I didn't understand it, but somehow, somehow you have this, this optical element that causes the starlight to interfere with itself through some kind of spiraling arrangement. I mean, it's a null, another form of nulling, basically. So in order to get an image of, of in, or, in order to get an image of a, sort of terrestrial planet in the habitable zone, you're going to have to basically cancel the starlight one way or another. Well, so a very simple idea. Using a mechanical, this would be taking place in space. Mm -hmm. Using a mechanical map of, say, one kilometer diameter would be very wide. Put very far away, I guess. Yeah. Exactly. Right. I think you, you run into the diffraction optics anyway. It doesn't help. It doesn't really help. You can, what, what, what uh, coronagraphs do is they, they put a, a mask in the pupil plane and, and uh, you, can, you can basically try to kill the diffraction pattern that way. Uh, so the, the masks that are used now um, are much more clever than just trying to put something in front of the object. Um, and so th they're, they're pretty good. They, they knock things down by a factor of 10,000 or something, but that's not good enough for, for this problem. So you really need to be more sophisticated. But pe so people have several ideas about how to really cancel the star out completely or almost completely. Um, one of them has been semi-demonstrated. Uh, we're, we're not there yet, but I, you know, I, I suspect it'll happen. So I, I think we will get direct images of, of planets at some point. In the meantime, you can just try to image um, giant planets that are separated more from their stars. And that, that's going to happen in the next few years, I suspect. Like the Keck interferometer is capable of imaging a Jupiter if you find one around a star that's within you know, 10 or 20 light years of here. So we're, we're getting there. There, w there will be direct images in reflected light of planets, but it's, it's very tough and it's not going to happen right away. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. Um, is there any scenario accepted uh, somewhat that uh, a star could explode and leave behind in its wake the solar system? I was bouncing around websites and some astronomers seem to think that might be what happened here, but does, does anyone, uh, instead of the disk forming around the star, the star explodes and what you're left with is kind of a cross section of what has in the star and its system of that time? Well, amazingly enough, yes, <laughs> but not certainly not our solar our solar system or any normal solar system. The, there, the first, there, I, I didn't say it in my talk, but there there has already been one detection of extrasolar terrestrial planets, and that was around a pulsar. A pulsar is a, a neutron star, and so that's what's left after a, a high mass star exploded. And there are three terrestrial planets around that. Pulsar, uh, two of which are kind of Earth, Earth sized, and one is smaller. Pul pulsars uh, allow you to do the, the the radial velocity technique vastly better than than you normally can because the the pulsar you know is an absolute time standard uh, with extraordinarily high accuracy. So you can detect the Doppler shift, you know, in, in the pulse timing uh, caused by by an Earth around the pulsar without any difficulty. You know, velocities of one centimeter per second are easy to detect if you have a pulsar. <laughs> so that was, that was actually the first extrasolar planet detection of any sort, and it was of terrestrial planets. And, and they're quite certain about it because they actually can even detect the change in timing as the planets 
pass each other, one planet slows down, the other one speeds up a little bit, they can see that in the, in the signal. Those planets are also not only the Earth size, but they're sort of at, at Earth distances from the pulsar. Now a pulsar is the result of a supernova explosion of a supergiant star. The star, the surface of the star was past where those planets are <laughs> before it exploded. So that, you know, to our enormous surprise, it appears that during the explosion, there was enough of an asymmetry that stuff from the bottom and stuff from the top pancaked in the middle, formed a disk, and <coughs> terrestrial planets formed out of that. Um, so there is that system. It's extremely weird. But it was seriously disinfected, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, it was, not only was, but is. It, it, it is being seriously disinfected. So, so the reason you haven't maybe heard of this is, you know, it's not exactly an interesting solar system for life because the, the, the central object is, you know, a, a 10 kilometer neutron star that sprays the system with extremely high energy radiation all the time and doesn't provide any light. <laughs> so, so yeah, they must be extraordinarily unpleasant places to be, these, these planets, but, but they're there. And so they, they did form from the explosion of a star. That's not the scenario for any normal solar system. Yeah. Yes, uh, I was just recently reading about the uh, South African South African <coughs> search array called the Super Wasp, where they, um, uh, they're starting to set up and search for extrasolar planets there. Right. And um, uh, isn't it, I, I thought that there were only three eclipsing uh, binaries found that have been found to date and that isn't it a, a software computing problem to find these things? Well, first of all, no. Uh, eclipsing binaries are the bane of, of transit planet searches. Uh, there are about 25 planetary transit searches going on now from the ground. They don't expect to find terrestrial planets, but they expect to find giant planets. The radial velocity people have, have determined what the frequency of inner giant planets is. It's, you know, several percent. So all of these searches expect to see uh, several percent. Well, then <laughs> down by the, um, the inclination factor, okay? So <clears throat> they've all computed their, their detection rates, uh, and they all have fallen way short of those. And the, and the basic problem, there's the duty cycle problem. So any survey from the ground has the, the day-night cycle killing it, and there's bad weather <laughs> making things even worse. Um, and beyond that, the, the problem <coughs> is that photometry from the ground is just subject to systematic variations due to the, the, you know, as the night transparency changes and clouds, thin clouds go by and so on, people haven't apparently counted properly for those noise sources. So a paper recently came out which tried to do that and show why all these transit searches, Super Wasp and all the rest of them, are not finding transiting planets at nearly the rate that they expect to. Um, but <coughs> what they do find a lot of is eclipsing binaries. <laughs> so, so that's the problem with, with transit searches. Uh, there's one going on run by the Kepler project called the Vulcan search. Um, we've found a hundred you know, potential planetary transits, so they've all turned out to be eclipsing binaries. And you have, you have to go after them and test them. You have to take the candidate target and, that, and then do a radial velocity test on it because if, it's a, if it is an eclipsing binary, the star, one star is pulling another star around a lot, you know, so you can actually see that very easily. And so usually they fail that test. And then, and then there's the background binaries problem, which, you know, the, the ones which have passed the first test have failed the second test. Uh, so there have been, there have been about, um, I think it's eight now, eight giant planets detected by transit searches that's all 25, most of them by the Ogle uh, search. Not su Super Wasp is just sort of getting going. Um, but it's hard because they have, Super Wasp has a huge field of view. They're going to see all kinds of events. Almost all of those are going to be eclipsing binaries. They're going to have to follow them all up and eliminate them. And then, you know, maybe they'll be left a few, with a few planetary transits. So, and Kepler, you know, in, in a sense has the same problem, except Kepler, uh, with giant planet transits like what all these other searches are sensitive to, we can tell immediately that that's what we have. You know, it's, a, it's, a huge, it's a huge event for Kepler and it has a very detailed shape. 
that we have really good signal and noise on, unlike the, the ground-based searches. So we're, we won't be confused by those things like, like they are. Are you the PI of Kepler? <coughs> I am not the PI of Kepler. Let me, let me uh, emphasize that strongly. Uh, I'm so glad I'm not the PI of Kepler. <laughs> <laughs> the PI of Kepler has to worry about all the NASA stuff all the time. I can actually go off and think about the science. <laughs> Um, the PI is Bill Baruki at NASA Ames, and the deputy PI is Dave Koch, also at NASA Ames. Yeah. Uh, with these, uh, CCD arrays having you know this basically the same star on the same pixel for four years, is there any concern that that pixel itself is going to get affected by a sort of constant bombardment? No, uh, there is a concern that the pixels will be affected by cosmic radiation <laughs> bombarding the, uh, the CCDs. That, that will be a problem. Uh, I should say that it's not exactly that way. <coughs> the current plan is to roll, the spacecraft rolls four times a year by 90 degrees because the solar panels are basically on one side of it. So you, you have to keep turning it to, to keep them towards the sun. So four times a year, it'll shift. The, the, as you saw, the CCD array on the sky is symmetric, so <coughs> everything will go by 90 degrees. You'll have all the same stars on CCDs, but it won't be the same pixels. But, uh, but in any case, the, yeah, no, the pixels aren't going to wear out because of starlight, but they will suffer radiation damage, uh, some of them. Yeah? This has been bugging me for a while, so, <laughs> so far, um, the scientists get real excited about uh, terrestrial planets, right? And they get real excited about water, H2O. Right. Okay, on the third rock from the sun in our galaxy, <laughs> that's, what, that's what's so crucial for life, right? Right. But, um, and then we found water on Mars, found water on uh, some moons, like Right. That. Is it maybe um, relevant to explore that maybe we would be overestimating our own planet's relevance of, of water being the, the, the foundation of life? Well, could it, could it be in our, in our galaxy here, we're looking for water in places. We, we, you know, laser beams and something for water. What if, what if there's, we don't know enough to not know that there's a, there's a being that, that, that uh, operates off hydrogen or off... Uh, off no, you're, you're quite right. Uh, we, we don't know what else out, might be out there or what else we maybe should be looking for, but that's the point. We don't know. So since we don't know, uh, you know, as scientists, we say, well, all right, let's start with what we do know. And, and the only thing, one of the very few things that seems to be common to all life on the Earth is that it uses liquid water. And there are very good chemical reasons for that. Um, but you're quite right. It could be that we're fooling ourselves. It could be that there are many other ways of doing life. You know, I, I'm I, several times already today. I've had discussions with people, and I, I say, you know, well, what about machine life? Some people refuse to call machine life life. Um, that's fine. We can differ about that. I think there are many ways to, to accomplish life, uh, but we don't know any of them except for the the carbon water based one. So. So it's just a scientific choice right now. Uh, we're not ruling out any, any options. We're, we're not ruling it out, but we're also not going after it because we, we know so little. You know, it's sort of, that would be just groping in the dark. We might as well, since we don't know anything about anything, we might as well start with, you know, with something that we know something about and see, see how far we get with that first. But, you know, I, I, I wouldn't argue with you. It, it's probably the case that nature is far more inventive than we imagine. That, that seems to have been the general paradigm. So I won't be in the least surprised if somebody turns up completely bizarre life. But that's not what we're looking for because we just don't know any better. Yes? Let me just sign off these two questions. Okay, on the Hubble Space Telescope mission board, what? No, I hear all Some. Do you have any insight or uh, what's well, going with that? Well, yeah, kind of. Okay, so Hubble, I, I think the question, the question is, uh, what's all this uh, back and forth about the next Hubble repair mission versus no more Hubble repair missions or turning it off or whatever? Um, the Hubble was planned to be a finite lifetime mission. Uh, it's reaching near the end of its lifetime. On the other hand, there was one more mission planned, servicing mission planned, and each servicing mission they 
they design new instruments, they build them, they get them ready, they take them up there, and, and the Hubble's better. So that all happened. Uh, you know, the, the next generation of Hubble instruments is built. It's sitting at the Cape. It's ready to go. Uh, so that's, that was a lot of money and effort and time. So people would like to see that happen. You know, so, what, so why don't we? Uh, well, there was the shuttle accident. And NASA, I think, is being incredibly obtuse about the shuttle accident. They, you know, the Columbia Accident Board reported they, they had a lot of recommendations. NASA's trying to follow them. And then they got super literal about it. You know, that we have to follow all of these. And anything that's not in this parameter space, we don't want to deal with. And, and Sean O'Keefe made this decision that it was too dangerous to go back to Hubble. Well, it wasn't any more dangerous next time than it was last time. <laughs> you know, plus, what are the odds the shuttle's going to have the same accident the next time? I'd say they were real low. I mean, you know, when the main engines blow, you know, all this work on the tiles is going to be, like, really irrelevant. So <clears throat> I think they're being silly. And the astronauts who would be putting themselves at risk are totally gung-ho to go do it. Now, the, the new administrator is, a, is more of a scientist, and he's more willing to consider going. And I believe it's actually in the current budget or the proposed budget to, to go do the last mission. Um, the other problem is that the, the, the next generation space telescope, the James Webb, is overrunning costs like crazy. They've descoped it twice. I don't know what's going to happen with that. Uh, and so that's another reason to maybe keep Hubble going a, lot, a little bit longer. But astronomers have to recognize that it's extremely expensive. The, the Hubble has turned out to be an extremely expensive experiment. It's also turned out to be an extremely valuable experiment. It's really revolutionized all kinds of fields. Um, but, you know, it is very expensive. So we have to ask ourselves, is the money better spent this way or that way? So far, I think most astronomers feel it would be, it is worth it to, to do the last Hubble, Hubble servicing mission. Nobody's pushing for more. Um, and, and I think it, its fate will partly depend on how James Webb looks and whether that, <laughs> whether that tanks uh, like it's been tanking. Sorry, what's the total cost of Hubble so far? <laughs> that, that, that depends on how you count it. Like um, the most extreme example. Like well, I mean, you know, billion, uh, billion, every, every shuttle launch costs half a billion dollars. Right. So, you know, you could, that's what, five or that's six, five million. or six of those, and then uh, the, the Hubble itself was sort of a billion, and then the, the fix was kind of a billion, and the, and then the, the Space Telescope Institute spends a couple hundred million a year. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> You know, on the other hand, you know, a week in Iraq costs way more than that. So, I, you know, it's, it's a matter of priorities. So, do you believe life is out there? I, I strongly believe life is out there. I, I, I mean, but it's just a belief. I want to focus this question because it's the thing you, have, you haven't really addressed this. It's just, you must, you must have strong opinions. It's so interesting, this search for planets that could host life. We, everybody senses that why that's interesting. How, right. when you find some candidates, how would you like to see that followed up? We're, we're not going to be able to follow up the Kepler candidates, as I, as I said in the talk. What, what Kepler is going to do is establish that it's pretty likely that there are lots of them or that, that it's not so likely that there are lots of them. Uh, the follow-up is going to have to happen with interferometers. In order to determine whether there's life on the planet, our best shot right now is to be able to take an infrared spectrum of the planet, which means separating the the planet from the star one way or another. One, I mean, one way to do it is if, if it is a planet that eclipses, that gets eclipsed by the star, you can try to take a spectrum of the system, you know, with the planet present and the planet absent and, and try to get the difference. That's actually been done with one transiting or uh, two transiting planets already with very low spectral resolution. So, yeah, so why do you want that? <laughs> Uh, it turns out there are features in the infrared spectrum due to carbon dioxide. There are features due to ozone. There are features due to water. Uh, you can, if you find, for example, that the planet's atmosphere shows a methane feature and a 
uh, ozone feature, it practically guarantees that there's life on the planet because methane and ozone are chemically incompatible with each other. The Earth has them both because life produces methane constantly and, and there's so ozone. So the paradigm is you recognize life by its chemical that's our best hope right now, I mean, and then for the next 50 years. If we can get a spectrum in the infrared uh, of a planet, we can, we can at least say we do or do not see, you know, pretty good signs of life. Well, no, that would be much better. <laughs> I mean, so the, the SETI search is going on to, the SETI detects, you know, artificial signals from a planet. Not only did you figure out there's life on that planet, but it's actually intelligent life. So that, that's far better. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. I just don't know how, how likely that is. May I, may I ask a completely philosophical question? <laughs> if it's the last question. <laughs> Could exist. Do you think it would have any change on societal behavior? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, what I th what I think might have more of a change on societal behavior is if, if we find, to our enormous surprise, that terrestrial planets are very rare. You know, if 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 society if people come to believe that the Earth is pretty unique in the galaxy and that we're screwing it up. Uh, I, I have optimism that that would, at some level, cause people to think about things differently. If we find that life is all over the place, I don't know, what, you know <laughs> maybe, maybe that'll pump up Homeland Security. I don't, I, I don't know what it'll do. <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what happens. <laughs> okay, so. thank you.